What's up everyone? My name is Melissa McCack and this is Teach the Teach, where I teach you how to teach a board game. And in this video, I'll be covering Scythe. Now there are a lot of ways to teach games. I'm going to be showing you how I teach this game and what's worked for me. Now, Jamie Stegmeier has come out with a video and he even put it into the rule book and came with this little uh, quick start suggestion guide, which is really cool on how to teach the game, which is super awesome. I don't know very many games that do this. I don't know of any other game that has done this actually. So I think it's really awesome that he did this. Now, why am I making this video? Some of the stuff that he talks about hasn't quite worked for me which is fine, but I've come up with a way that has worked for me. So maybe it'll also work for you if his way hasn't worked for you. So let's get into it. The first thing I always try to do, right? I say it in every video, I am trying to get players to play as quickly as possible. Now I find this game to be a little bit of a beast to teach, but I'm gonna try my best, okay? So I start off with uh, what the story of the game is, right? Why are we even in this world? I always start off with that. Then I go into the objective, right? Trying to get the most coins, being the wealthiest person at the end of the game. And then I say how the game ends with the little stars. Whenever somebody puts out their sixth star, the game immediately ends. That way they have a foundation of how this whole game works. So then I get right into it. I start, I like to start off with the objectives. I point them to the top here along this track saying what each one does, what you have to do in order to complete each of those objectives. Then I go into the popularity track here and I tell them about the thresholds and how the more popularity you have, the more coins you're going to get at the end of the game. And then I go through each column there where you're going to get coins for your territories and your resources and yada yada. Okay, so now they know what objectives to kind of go for and they know how some of the end game scoring is going to work, which is great. It gives them some sort of focus. I then go into their actions, right? And I go through each of the top actions with them. So Jamie Segmeyer has it where you sort of force the players to take a different action, right? I don't like to force players to take uh, certain actions. I like them to sort of choose whatever they want, even if the first action doesn't make all that much difference. It still gives them some sort of feeling like they're the ones playing this game, okay? So I go into each of the top row actions. I don't explain the bottom row yet. And usually I'll start off with maybe the bolster action here, okay? Because that one is the easiest. It's just you pay a coin, you get the two bolster, great. Then I might move over to production. And I say, I try to focus on letting them know, listen, for each worker you have in those spaces, you're going to get that many resources. And then this is also where I get to tell them what each location is called, because I might go, all right, so for the mountains, you're going to get metal. And I'll circle it, metal, right? So that way they know, okay, Everything here, these are called mountains, and then you can go into the tundras, the villages, and all these things. Cool, and that could be good for their objectives because some objectives have, you need to control a certain amount of villages or whatever it might be. So now they'll sort of know what each territory is called. Then I move over to the trade action where it just allows you to get the two resources of any kind and that's pretty easy because now they already know a little bit from your production action so trade will be a little bit easier to I explain. then go into movement and movement is a little bit difficult because there's movement restrictions so it could get a little bit wonky in a way that's why I save it for the last action that way they pick up on the first three pretty quickly and then we get into the big bulk of stuff so I start off with listen those rivers here are not just there to be pretty, they have some sort of restrictions, right? Workers can never move through them. You can't move anything through them until you gain that ability through your max and deploying them. But we'll get into that later, right? When we're talking about the bottom row actions. So you talk and about then that. And I might say something along the lines of your characters moving onto a space with one of these cool little encounter tokens. And I'll just say, when you end your movement there, your character kind of activates this encounter token, you'll remove it, and then you'll gain one of these really cool encounter cards that give you some sort of benefit, right? Awesome. 
then at this point, I let them go ahead and take their first action and I'll have everybody take their first action around and around until we enter the second round where I say, all right, now we can go into our bottom row actions and this is going to give them a little bit more focus too because at this point for the bottom row actions, they need certain resources. And I think Jamie Stegmeier also uh, talks about this where it, it will give them focus in terms of what resources they want to get. So I then go into, all right, this is, I, I think I sort of do it randomly. I'll sort of just look at my own board and kind of go from left to right, letting them know it might be a little bit different for them. So I might start with upgrade and letting them know, okay, when you take that action, you pay those resources and I'm letting them know everything in red means that's what you pay. So you pay the resources and then the upgrade, you get to move the cube down, you explain that. Then I might go into, so on this board, it's about uh, deploying mechs. So I tell them, pay the resources, you get to deploy the mechs with a worker. I stress that anytime you place something onto the board, it is usually being placed on a territory with a worker. People mess this up all the time. I don't know why, maybe I'm not explaining it very well, but you are deploying it with a worker. I try to stress Next, that. I go into maybe your structures. Now, actually I got something pretty easy here, right? Upgrading and deploying mechs is probably the best to start off with because those are the easiest to explain. Then the structures and enlistment might be a little more difficult. So this is actually kind of a perfect order to do it. So I might say, okay, you could build your structures. And then I might tell them a little bit about what each structure does, all right? And then at that point, I'll point them to the last objective that they can go for, right? The building structures uh, objective, okay? Letting them know what you have to do in order to get those coins at the end of the game. The last thing you have to teach them at this point is the enlist action. And this one could be a little bit tricky for players who might not be familiar with these types of rules. So if I, so first I just tell them you get that immediate action on your character space. Great. Then I have to stress how whenever you or the player to your left or right also takes that specific action that you have unveiled, you will also gain that benefit. And I try to tell them, just think left, right, center. If the person to your left or your right or yourself takes that action that you unveiled, you get that benefit. I've had it in the past where people get a little bit confused. They think something along the lines of maybe when anybody takes the action or they have to take the enlist action so that you could get all the bet. I don't know. So I try to make only the part that you have unveiled is what you get if they take that particular action. Okay. And then at that point, I might say, okay, this is probably something you want to work towards. You might want to get certain, pick a bottom row action that you want to take and you want to start to work towards those resources that you need in order to take that bottom row action. I'm getting that straight from Jamie Steigmeier. So that's nothing new. And at there. that point, I let them take a round again. They could start playing now. And I don't explain combat immediately because that's just a whole other sort of thing that they have to start to think about. And it's just not prevalent at the beginning of the game usually because people can't really get close enough to each other to even start up combat usually at the beginning of the game. But I do let them know that you're bolstering and these combat cards that you have will all help towards combat. I also let them know at this point, after they've all taken a round, actually before they've taken the second round for the bottom row action, I let them know about the factory in the middle and how that will allow you, if you, you know, you get your character there and you get a control, you get one of these cool little factory cards and I let them know You'll get to pick them all up, choose one, and it essentially gives you another action you can take for the rest of the game. And that it's also worth three territories. What then what? as things start to move along a little bit quicker and people are starting to get a little bit closer together uh, and combat is allowed to happen, so pretty much maybe a couple rounds before I think that combat might ensue, I start to explain what combat is. And I just go into, so now if they're familiar with some of the ways that combat has worked in other games, like maybe uh, 
Dune or Rex or whatever. This might be a little bit easier, but let's say they're not. I just let them know seven. The seven on that uh, bolster track is circled for a reason because you can only bet up to seven. Okay. And I explain how combat works, how it's sort of this uh, risk slash reward management combat system where you're sort of saying, okay, I might wager seven power and then I could put up to as many combat cards as there are plastic units in the territory that will add to my power. Okay. So you place it and then you'll reveal at the same time, right? Letting them know also that the attacker wins ties. That's important because most games have it that the defender wins ties. But in this, the attacker wins ties, which is pretty interesting. And letting them know you can actually claim that objective twice. That's the only objective you could claim twice. And of course, I let them know about losing popularity if you drive workers out. And then what actually happens to all the units that were defeated in that combat and how they go back to their home base. And I let them know, but if you've lost and you spend at least one power, you get a combat card. And at that point, they pretty much know everything they need to know on how to play Scythe. And they were able to start playing pretty much as quickly as possible. I think that the first part in terms of just teaching them, okay, objective, the popularity track, the first actions, that takes about maybe 10 to 15 minutes to explain. And then you could get right into playing it. And then it takes maybe another 10 to 15 minutes to explain the bottom row actions, maybe less than 15 minutes, probably about no more than 10 minutes, I think, to explain the bottom row actions. And then they're playing. And then you could explain combat in pretty much about five minutes, I think. So all in all, you're teaching the game in, I'd say around a half an hour while they're already playing, which makes things go pretty smoothly and is a little more interesting, a little more fun, I think. So if you have any sort of questions, please let me know in the comments below. Let me know how you teach this game. You can follow me on social media. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.